It's great to everybody. My name is Chuck Wilson. I'm the pastor, and we welcome you whether you're live or live stream. Uh, I know lots of folks watching every week faithfully, so it's great to have you all worshiping with us. We have a special treat for you. Good friend of mine, uh, Mike and Mike Fulmer and his wife Chris are here, and Mike's been a, a great friend of mine for many, many years now, 25 years now. Yeah, we we haven't changed. We haven't changed. Uh, yes. And many here, uh, good friends with Mike, and he's been a great friend to New Hope Community Church, he and Chris. Uh, at the beginning, you guys were here a couple times, right? You know, you guys were here, right? A couple services and maybe many more than that. But it's just been a real encouragement to our church and to me personally and to many here. And uh, Mike has, and Chris have been through a lot over the last 20 year, five years, which you're going to get to hear. And he wrote a book called um, Peace and Joy. Joy and Hope in the Midst of... Painful trials, yeah, okay. So, and I actually read it before you even put it out. He sent me a copy online and I got to read it, I got to read it one of the first ones. So it's gonna be a, a real uh, encouragement. And you'll have, he's gonna share, which you know, I, I warned you, I encouraged you. Uh, I'm sure nobody here can relate to that book title, right? So, but uh, the books are available at the back and the proceeds go to help with the ministry in Ukraine, right? So the proceeds go toward that. So he'll be sharing about the Ukraine also. Uh, the, they're heavily involved in the Ukraine. Been there. So I'll let you guys, I'll let you come on up and uh, let's give Mike uh, a welcome here. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you all. First of all, thank Pastor Chuck. I'm trying not to mess up this mic. Uh, thank Pastor Chuck for giving me this opportunity, um, and thank you all for the opportunity just to share some things from our lives, um, and most importantly, talk about the things that God has done in our lives and the things that he's taught us. Uh, before I, I start, though, if I could, I'd like to just pray one more time, because I just, uh, I, well, I'm, let me just let pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, I uh, such a privilege to be one of your children, Lord. Such a privilege to enjoy your love, your provision, your care each and every day. And Lord, um, as I stand up here to, to share the things that you showed Chris and I, and things that you continue to show Chris and I, Lord, I pray, may this be about you, Lord. May this be about your love, your faithfulness, your incredible grace and the fact that uh, we are constant works in progress and that you just never stop loving and caring and growing us. And so, Lord, we just pray your Holy Spirit would guide my heart and guide those that are listening so that we might hear the things that you want us to hear and know. And we pray these things in your holy and precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. All righty. Um, this is see from the first slide the uh, entitled I'm going to share with you a journey and the journey I refer to is finding joy and hope in the midst of painful trials uh, my name is Mike Fulmer as uh, Pastor Chuck had shared next slide please and our story really began on the 4th of July we were gathered in my brother Dan's house uh, which was a common occurrence uh, most of the family was out back surrounding the barbecue, laughing, telling jokes, and, and just doing the things that we as a family did. Um, my brother Dan, my younger brother Greg, and my dad, we were out the side of the house playing horseshoes because that's something we had done since we were kids. It was a fierce competition. I really badly wanted to win. <laughs> and, uh, and as... We're throwing the shoes. I look, and my brother, who's left-handed, he throws a shoe, and all of a sudden I see this in his hand. And I said, Dan, I said, what, what's, what's, what's with the hand? He goes, I don't know. He says, it just started. I said, well, have you gone to a doctor? And he goes, no, no not yet. I, I will. And I said, well, Dan, I'm going to call you every week until you do, because I worked in the healthcare field, and I knew how important it was to get diagnosed early, get treated early, to improve the possibility of, of emerging from whatever the health condition is. So he did. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, what we learned was that he had a rare neurological condition called Lewy body dementia. 
It's an awful, awful disease. It's uh, like a rapidly progressing Parkinson's and a rapidly progressing dementia. It uh, attacked his body, ultimately put him in a wheelchair, um, attacked his mind. My brother Dan had a genius IQ, brilliant, brilliant mind. You know, he got the brilliance. I'm not sure what I got, but anyway. Um, and, uh, and then in the late stages, it gave him hallucinations. Um, just an awful, awful disease. Uh, when we, I went with him on one of his appointments, met with a physician up in, uh, we went up to Massachusetts because I, I knew a neurologist, was one of the top neurologists in the country, and, uh, and I wanted to have the best possible care for him, and he shared different things with us, um, and one of the things he shared was life expectancy is seven years, and that's exactly what it was for my brother Dan. It was very hard because Dan and I were extremely close. Chris was really close to both Dan and his wife, uh, Kathy, and I was as well. We used to vacation together. We were over their house all the time. They were our house all the time. Um, and as it got closer and closer to the end, when it finally got to that last day, when we said goodbye, I was the one that everybody was sort of leaning on. I was the rock of the family, and I wasn't that day. I mean, I just broke down, and I bawled like a baby. I just cried my eyes out. It was just very hard. Uh, but that, unfortunately, was just the beginning. Next slide, please. <clears throat> While Dan was still going through this disease and before he had actually passed, we had additional family losses. Uh, Chris's dear dad uh, suffered from cardiovascular complications, and we said goodbye to him. Uh, Chris's mom, which is the third from the, from the left, uh, there's Chris, um, our daughter Jen, and her mom, uh, she had uh, kidney cancer. So then we say goodbye to her mom. Um, very, very hard. Next slide, please. Um, then came the loss of my dad. Uh, he had been a heavy smoker as we were growing up and uh, it eventually took his life. He had COPD, and it's tough to watch someone you love gasping for breath, just trying to survive. Um, so he had an event, emergency room, took him to the hospital. They said, oh, we're gonna send him to the physical therapy unit uh, just to strengthen him a little bit. He should be fine. He lasted a day or two, and that was goodbye to dad. Two years before Dan passed, his wife, Kathy, was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. So not long, only two years after Dan passed, we said goodbye to Kathy. And that was another heartbreak. It was just so, so hard. Next slide, please. Uh, you're there. Uh, you're way ahead of me, thank you. <laughs> uh, next, next came my mom. My mom was the rock of our family. She was the most loving, caring, most selfless person I've ever known. I mean, just, I can't begin to, to say enough about my mom. And she was strong. And then she got Alzheimer's. And I watched her slowly, and if you have family members that have had Alzheimer's going through it, they slowly start disappearing before your eyes. The body's still there. But, and it's so hard, so hard. So then we're dealing with that. I was in 2010, a number of months later. I am, uh, I'm watching, I'm at home, watching Eagles game. I get a phone call from my dear wife saying, hey Mike, uh, it's me. Um, just run some errands. I got uh, one or two more stops. I'll be home in an hour. So when, when my dear wife says, I'm running around and I'll be home in an hour, I know two things. One is that she will come home. The second is it will not be in an hour. <laughs> so I watched the game. I was watching Eagles preseason game. And the scrubs are in. I'm starting to fade away. And, and I fall asleep on the couch. And suddenly I hear, Mike, Mike. I kind of wake up and then I hear, Mike, Mike. I go run into the front door and there's our, Beth, our, our uh, neighbor, Beth. 
And she said, I said, Beth, what's the matter? Her eyes are like dinner plates. She goes, it's Chris. I said, what about Chris? She's been in an accident. I said, where? At the end of the drive. So I open the door, barefoot, I run down. We have a 400-foot drive. I'm running down the drive. As I'm running down the drive, I look, and over on the left is a police car, and the right is an ambulance. I see Chris laying out in the street. And as I get to the end, I'm getting close. A uh, police officer comes over to me, Mr. Fulmer, um, I'd like to talk to you for a minute. And I said, not now. I need to get to my wife. And he said, sorry, uh, Mr. Fulmer, if I could just talk to you for a minute. So I went and I shoved the police officer and ran to her, got down on my hands and knees and got face to face with her. I said, "Hun, what happened? Well, as it turned out, she had stopped to get the mail. Uh, we had a uh, Ford Explorer at the time, and uh, which we later referred to as the bad car, and I'll tell you why. Um, but she got out of the car to get the mail, and when she got out of the car, which was running, it slipped in reverse. As it slipped in reverse, the door hit her, knocked her to the ground, and then the front swung around, and the front tire ran over her midsection, her pelvic area. Um, the next slide, please. It was a horrible accident. When I think about her lying out in that street, I just, but she ended up going to the hospital. She was in the, well, she went first, so I went through three surgeries. First night, she went through surgery to stop the internal bleeding. Second night, she had a surgery for her femur bone, which was broken. And then two days later, she had surgery for um, the broken pelvic bones. If you look at the slide, um, she has more hardware than probably your local hardware store. Um, yeah, so they, it was a major, major procedure. It took, I think, nine, 10 hours to do the surgery on her uh, pelvis. Uh, she went, uh, spent 10 days in the hospital. She spent a month in a physical rehabilitation center, wonderful center, um, three months in a wheelchair, and then um, a three-year recovery. And uh, the three-year recovery was tough. I mean, she couldn't walk, and finally she would get in a wheelchair, and then she got a walker, and she eventually got to a cane. Um, my wife is strong, um, but it was really so, so tough on her. Uh, I, th I so thank the Lord, so thank the Lord that she is still alive today. Uh, so she had that. We finished the three-year surgery, or finished the uh, three-year recovery period. Seemed like life was starting to get to normal. Uh, so I thought. And I found out that I had cancer in my cheek area. Uh, it all started with something fairly innocent. I had a squamous cell lesion. If anybody's of Irish descent, you probably know all about basal cell and squamous cell lesions. Um, and typically you go in and a dermatologic surgeon will go in, they do what they call a Mohs procedure where they cut out the area that's cancerous. They look at the borders, make sure that there's nothing in the borders. And once they get to the point where they've eliminated all possible cancer cells, then they say, yeah. I should have done that. Instead, I was concerned about the scar. I'd had the procedure once before, I left a fairly significant scar, and I said, you know, I think I'm gonna go to a plastic surgeon, because I really didn't want to mess up this pretty face. <laughs> so, yeah, not everything I've done in life has been smart. Um, but uh, sure enough, they, they didn't get all the cancer cells, and they began to grow under the skin and eventually became a malignant tumor. Uh, there was a lymph node that was wrapped around it. It was just pressing up against the nerve bundle. But uh, I went through the surgery. They removed the tumor. I went through uh, months of uh, radiation therapy. I thought, check that box. I've had cancer now. Okay, well, that's behind me. Well, not so quick. Um, a year later, uh, I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. 
I had uh, pain in my stomach. I thought I was getting an ulcer because of all the stress that we were under, and uh, but it wasn't. It was started as cancer up in my clavicle area, spread through all my GI system. So I was treated for that, went through my chemotherapy sessions, and uh, just before Christmas, declared remission. And then, a year later, I was at the gym working out, trying to get back, and you know, cancer can really take its toll on your body. So I was trying to get my strength back, trying to get back in shape. I noticed a lump in my arm as I was lifting weights. And I thought, all right, I pulled something. So I went to an orthopedist. The orthopedist said, well, it's probably a hematoma, which is a water buildup or blood buildup under the skin. And uh, wasn't the case. He called me and said, I hate to tell you, but your cancer's back. So I ended up going once again uh, back to the hospital. I was in the hospital for uh, a month. I underwent a uh, stem cell transplant and then treatments thereafter. Um, next slide, please. So between my second and third bout of cancer, I got a call from my brother. Well, my brother and I, we used to have this routine. And my brother would call and go, hey, how you doing? And I'd say, good, how you doing? <laughs> And we always had this routine. So I looked at my phone, I knew it was my brother. I go, how you doing? And he's crying. I hadn't heard my brother cry since we were kids. I said, Craig, what's going on? He goes, Sue. I said, what about Sue? She's dead. She's dead. She had dropped dead. There's nothing he could do like that. She was gone. One moment he had her, and one moment she was gone. And uh, he was devastated. So why do I bring all this up? And it's not to feel sorry for me, because that's, that is not my goal, or feel sorry for Chris. But um, you know, it brings to mind this question, why? Why so much suffering in this world? Why? Next slide, please. And it raises other questions. Like, how do we see past these, these moments? Is anxiety, I'm feeling anxious, is that a weakness in my faith? What can I do with it? If God's word says all things work together for good, how can this be good? What is God's purpose in all this? What's the relationship between trust and peace? And how do I eventually emerge from all this? So I think one of the things we have to look at is there's different things that we will face in life. Sometimes we face the consequences of our sinful behavior. Um, if I'm an individual who has angry outbursts and I'm snapping on people all the time, it's going to affect my wife, it's going to affect my children, it's going to affect all the people around me, it's going to have a huge impact, and it's going to affect me and my ability to walk with the Lord. Sometimes there's a collective situation where there's consequences. And the collective situation, Israel's a perfect example. Israel was a nation that God had chosen as his chosen people. He brings them out of Egypt. He brings them up into the promised land. He walks them in the land. Every nation that came against the Israelites and tried to not take them out was defeated. No matter how many soldiers they had, no matter how mighty their army, they could not beat Israel. So what does Israel do? Years go by. They start to get comfortable. They start slipping away from the Lord. They start worshiping other gods, intermarrying with other people, and they become a mess. And then the Lord says, okay, I'm taking away my protection. So then the Assyrians came in, took over the northern territory. Later, the Babylonians come in, take over the southern territory of Judah. And we read in Proverbs 3, 11, 12, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him who he loves as a father or son in whom he delights. So there's times where things happen that are a consequence of something we've done. But there's also another thing I'd like to talk about. Next slide, please. 
and that is the broken world in which we live. We live in a broken world. It wasn't the way God created it to be. Everything was perfect when God first created Adam and Eve. But starting with their sin and following with all the sins that have followed, it's become more and more broken. What are the consequences of the brokenness? We look at our environment, we look at our health, cancer, all these different things. Death, death didn't even exist when Adam and Eve were first created. So we live in a broken world. Things happen to us that aren't a result of something we specifically have done, but it's just the matter of the sin and how the sin has broken this world and changed it from what God intended it to be. Next slide. And I'd like to give you an example. It's, if you've been to a favorite lake and you look out on that lake, I mean, what do you think? You look and you say, oh my gosh, it is so beautiful. Lord, your creation is amazing. Oh, I love this. I love this. Now, next slide, please. Think about, you've seen kids throwing stones in a lake. What happens? Rock hits the lake and the circles go out. Well, that's a lot like our sin. <laughs> we sin and the circle goes out, it affects those closest to us and it starts affecting others and then it affects others beyond that. Next slide, please. Now, imagine millions, I'm sorry, go back one, please. Imagine millions and millions and millions and millions of people throwing rocks in that pond. That pond I showed you first, what do you think that's gonna look like? Not gonna look like the pond we saw at first. And that is basically, that's our world. That's the world that we live in. Now there is good because God is good. God has his children in the world. So there's a lot of good in the world. But there's also brokenness and that's the things that we have to deal with. Next slide, please. So how do we deal with the suffering and painful trials? Well, Philippians is an important verse in the scripture. All the verses are important, but this is one that really um, has meant a lot to me. It's just in, in verse 6 and 7 of chapter 4, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So, does this mean when something bad happens that we're supposed to say, okay, Lord, I'm good. Not the way it works. But I'm gonna talk more about that. And I, I think of the example of Jesus in the garden. I don't know if any of you have ever had the opportunity to go to Israel and go to the Garden of Gethsemane. I tell you, it, it really, it, it hits your heart when you go there. And Jesus, his own words, said to his disciples, and he said to them, my soul was very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. So he was feeling, he was feeling the pain. He knew that for the first time in his existence, he was going to be separated from the Father because of the sin. He was going to be carrying the weight of the sin of the whole world on his shoulders and his shoulders alone. He was going to be mocked. He was going to be whipped. He was going to be nailed to a cross and die on that cross. And he knew all this was lying ahead of him. But what was his response after that? My father, if it's possible, let the cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And I think there's an important lesson there. Next slide, please. I think when we have these kinds of situations, we need to acknowledge the pain. Uh, one of the things that I've learned, Chris and I lead a uh, ministry called Grief Share. And as we've led the ministry, we've come to realize that uh, people who try to stuff the pain, it'll carry on for a long time. So you have to recognize it, cry your tears. Um, however, we must be careful not to cast a rancor there. That's not where we want to live for the rest of our lives. It may take a while if you've lost a spouse or a child. You know it takes time. It takes a lot of time. 
to sort of work through that. But God walks with you. Uh, my next bullet was always see God who loves us and promises to walk with us. He is always, I'll never leave you or forsake you, he said. He's with us all the time. Pray, talk to him. Tell him how you feel. Say, Lord, I'm hurting so bad. Lord, I'm so confused. Lord, I don't know what to do next. Just tell him how you feel. He hears us. And we sometimes, I can share, sometimes we think, you know, God is way up there and we're down here. It's not what he says. His Holy Spirit comes. God's right here. He's standing right next to me right now. He's standing right next to each of you. So pray to him. Talk to him. Trust in the Lord and his promises and trust in his ability to bring us through it. Because he will. He will bring us through. And it brings to mind a number of promises. In Romans 8.38. Next slide, please. Um, for I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, or powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Christ Jesus, our Lord. He'll always be there for us. In our weakness, let's look at Philippians 4, 12, and 13. I know how to be brought low. This is Paul speaking to the Philippians. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And God is the source of our peace. Jesus himself said, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Next slide, please. One of the things that I recognize is, as Chris and I went through this is you have to recognize the blessings. It's hard to see when you're in those darkest moments, but those blessings are there. And if you really look and search for them, you will find them. Some of you may not recognize till later, but I look at the situation with Chris. When she had her accident, she was laying in the street crying out my name. I couldn't hear her. Our house was 400 feet away, and I could not hear. And when I think about that, when I think about today, it's, it's still really, really hard. But our neighbor's dog kept fussing, wanting to go out. She tried to let her out the back door because they had a fenced-in yard in the back dog wouldn't go they were watching tv so she went and brought the dog back okay forget it i sat down watched tv dog kept bussing wanted to go out wanted to go out wanted to go out kept going to the front door kept going to the front door finally she put a leash on the dog dog went right to chris and that is how she was discovered the trauma surgeon that she had that night happened to be on call was one of the best trauma surgeons in this area he was tremendous, uh, very skilled, very caring guy. Chris and Shirley Sutton, who were pastors of our church at the time, they were with us, or with me and with, with Chris until they took her to a room all night um, with such encouragement. Uh, we had been told that when she was going to physical therapy, they couldn't find a physical therapy unit in the area that had space for her. So they were going to send her to a nursing home not far from our house. I was pretty concerned about it. I went to the nursing home. I met with the people that are very nice, very caring, but I thought, are they, they equipped to deal with this kind of trauma? So um, one day, a social worker comes in, and this is not our regular social worker. She says, oh, I'm not assigned to Chris, but I just heard about the situation. I wanted to come in and see how you guys are doing. They said, yeah, well, we're doing well. They've taken good care of us. It's been hard. So where, where, uh, where is she going for physical therapy? I said, well, to a nursing home by us. She said, what? Well, yeah, that was, that was all they could get into. I'll be back. I'll, re I'll be right back. She goes off. I said, okay, I don't know what that means, but she comes back. She goes, listen, I happen to know the admission director 
for one of the top physical therapy units in this area. I called her, got Chris in. You just have to get there, get her signed up within this next hour. And I thanked her, and boy, I was gone. I went right to it, and they were such a blessing. They were terrific. Um, I think about her survival that night. Well, a physician who, a phys uh, who is known as a physiatrist, I've been in healthcare for 40 years. I didn't know what a physiatrist was, I'd never heard of it, but it's a physician who specializes in physical therapy. Met with us after she had finished her physical therapy and said, uh, you know, it's a miracle that Chris is alive. And I said, yeah, I know. And he goes, no, I don't think you do. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, people who have the kind of injury she had, they die the first night. There's so much vasculature in the pelvic area that we can't get on top of cutting off the bleeding. It is truly a miracle that she's alive. So that was another huge blessing. Well, we had a, um, someone who came to take care of her because Chris needed 24-7 care. And uh, there was a, a woman named Natalia who was assigned to us. She was a, a physician by training, came from the Republic of Georgia. She came to the US, didn't recognize her credentials. She's working as a nurse's assistant, taking care of patients. And you think some people may say, oh, somebody, she must have been pretty upset and sort of bitter. She was the most loving, caring person I've, I've known. Um, and she was so good to Chris. And then, of course, her recovery. I'll tell you one very short story. I'm going to embarrass you, hon. I'm sorry. But uh, we went to a wedding, and she at this point was on a cane. So she's on a cane, and uh, we're walking into the wedding, and she's stumbling in, and she hears me. Well, Chris loves, I mean, not loves, loves to dance. So she hears that music. All of a sudden, she puts the cane aside, and I see her. <laughs> I'm thinking, holy mackerel. <laughs> but her recovery has been amazing. I mean, she, my family refers to her as the Energizer Bunny, and uh, she is the Energizer Bunny. I try to keep up. Not so well sometimes, but I try. <laughs> Next slide, please. So let's go to God's promises. God promises, that, as you know, that those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, okay, let's go back. Oh, there it is, okay. Um, one word in there, key word, is, I think it's really, well, I've, let's talk about love, and then there's another th thing I want to talk about. What's it mean to love the Lord? Let's go to the next slide. I'm sorry. Thank you. You know, what does it mean to love the Lord? You ask uh, uh, any believer, do you love the Lord? Yeah, I love the Lord. Of course I love the Lord. Well, think about what it means to love somebody. If you truly love somebody, whether it be a parent, a best friend, your spouse, what do you do to strengthen that, that love? You seek to better know them. You spend time together. Inclusion, you try to include them in your everyday life. You make sure you put them first. You show appreciation. You show trust. You serve them. And patience, when you're asking for something from a patient. And you look at that and you say, so what's that look like in terms of our relationship with the Lord? How do we seek and get to know him better? God's word is a perfect way to get to know God better. Prayer is a perfect way to get to know him better. Time together, do we spend time seeking him in his word? Do we spend time seeking him through prayer? Putting others first, do we put his needs and his plan for our lives ahead of our own plans? I know I'm a type A person. I struggle with that sometimes, and that affects my trust because sometimes I'm trying to give stuff over, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Appreciation. When we pray, are we giving them the laundry list of our wants? How much time are we spending just thanking them, serving them? So as we go through these things, I don't know how you feel, but I go through this thing, you make you squirm a little bit. You say, oh, yeah, you, I could do better. Well, and that's okay, because we are all works in progress. 
When we make that commitment to the Lord, the Lord makes a commitment to continue working in our heart through the Holy Spirit, through his love, and growing us. But they are the things that we want to try to focus on. Next slide. In what or whom are we placing our trust? We mentioned trust. Uh, Matthew wrote, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I'm going to share a story, if I could. Next slide, please. When I went for my cancer treatment, found out I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, I went with Dr. Na I met with Dr. Nasta for the first time. They had done a biopsy. They took needles, put them into my gut, took some material from my lymph nodes. She said, okay, well, you have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay, well, I looked at the biopsy report before I went to see her because I had a patient portal. I could look at it. I said, okay, I knew that already. She goes, you have a certain type. It's diffuse large cell type B. I said, okay, I knew that too. And I knew, okay, a little bit about what the treatment was. She goes, the thing I don't know is I don't know what type of subtype of diffuse large cell type B you have. I said, I didn't even know there was a subtype. I thought that was a subtype, diffuse large cell type B. She goes, we need to do additional testing. I said, okay. I said, well, what do you think my prognosis is? So I really don't want to say. She goes, I, I would rather do some additional testing and then we'll, we'll you know, give you a sense. Well, I said, but, but what's your sense? I mean, what, what, what's your, your sense based on your, your experience? I really not, not, prefer not to say. I'm about to give away a little bit about who I am and my personality. So I said, yeah, but what's, what's your sense? What's your <laughs> she said, your prognosis may, may be 50-50. With that, I tried to catch my breath. I looked at Chris, she was crying, and Chris is not a crier. She said, uh, all right, here's what I wanna do. She goes, I know 4th of July is two days away. I'm not sending you home. Instead, I'm sending you across the street to the hospital. And I had read for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, typically treatment is three hours of chemo, six treatments, maybe eight, and each one is three weeks apart. She said, I'm sending you across the uh, street to the hospital. You're going to get chemo. We're going to give you chemo 24 hours a day for five straight days. And then we're going to assess. So as you can imagine, I was kind of freaking out. Um, I thought, wow, I, this could be the end. And, and I, things are running through my head. I'm thinking, well, okay, if I'm dying, i got to i got to print out the, the reports from Quicken because she'll never be able to navigate Quicken. And if, if, if I'm dying, I've got a binder with all the key contacts and stuff. i got, I got to update that. And if I'm dying, and I'm sort of going through this list and going through this list, and uh, that night, um, as I went to bed, I prayed, and I said, Lord, if you're getting ready to bring me home, Lord Jesus, please give me peace. Help me just to accept it, Lord um, uh, take care of my family, Lord. Just, just please take care of Chris and Jen and Tim and the grandkids, Lord. And, and, and Lord, um, last of all, just help me to finish strong. And that was my prayer. I got up the next day. I had peace like I have never had in my life. I cannot properly describe it, but I was totally at peace. I had a... a um, resident came in and said, listen, um, we're, we're taking a class and we're doing a study on the impact of people's faith on recovery. And I was wondering if we could talk, I could talk to you. I said, yeah. Oh, I said, I got nowhere to go and lots of time to get there. So yeah, come on in. So, um, so we talked for a while and she said, you know, you seem awful happy for somebody that's in your situation. And that was, that was God's peace when I, he answered that prayer. However, next slide. I want to contrast it with a situation. I had a company that developed continuing medical education programs. I had it for 25 years. Um, when Chris came home, I retired early so that I could take care of her. And when I did, I turned it over to a member of the staff. It did not go well. The company was struggling. We'd gone through a series of layouts. And as I'm going through it, I'm praying. I said, Lord, 
I know this is your company, and Lord, you know, you've given me the privilege of leading this for the past 20 years, and Lord, I just ask that, you know, just, just guide me. If you're getting ready to shut it down, help me to do whatever you're calling me to do, and just give me peace. I had no peace. I'd lay in the wake at night, and I'd struggle, and I'd think, oh, i got to contact this. I can work with this medical society. We haven't worked with them in a while. And, and oh, i got an idea for a new platform. Yeah, we could do this. And my mind is spinning all the time. And I kept praying that same prayer again and again and again, and I had no peace. And I thought to myself, why? Why would I not have peace after I had such great peace in the hospital and I thought I was dying? And I finally came to realize that there was a problem, and the problem was me. I would give it over to the Lord, and then right away I'd say, well, I'm taking that right back because I can do this, and I can do that, and I can do this. And we need to do our part, but are we willing to accept wherever God is leading us and just seek him and trust him throughout it? And that was a lesson that I had to learn when I went through this situation. Next slide, please. So the other thing I'd like to look at in Romans 8.28 is all things work together for good. This is one of the most misunderstood sections of scripture I've seen. People think, and I hear it preached sometimes, which is really scary, if you truly love the Lord, you give your heart fully to the Lord, everything's going to be perfect. Everything's going to be good. You're not going to have any problems, and if you have problems, because you haven't fully given yourself to the Lord. God never promised that. What God promises is that he's going to take care of us. Let's, next slide, please. See, the problem is we tend too often to look at our circumstances and define whether our life is good or not by our circumstances. You know, I use these examples. I got a new job and a bump in salary. I'm happy. <laughs> I just got laid off. I'm not happy. I met the girl in my dreams. I'm happy. She left me for one of my close friends. I'm not happy. My wife and I just had our first child. I am happy. Principal wants another meeting. Oh my gosh. So if we focus our lives and focus our sense of whether our life is good based on our circumstances, it is going to be a roller coaster. I guarantee it. But what can we focus on that never changes? Given the gift of eternal life is one. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him not perish but have eternal life. What a great promise. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the, we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. No one can snatch this out of his hand. I will give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one, no one will snatch them out of my hand. We're transformed by the Holy Spirit, Ezekiel. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit and I will put within you. Uh, um, we become children of God. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. In Revelation, when we get to heaven, he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning. We're crying. No pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. We must never forget these promises. We need to focus on these promises. We have a, uh, a future that we can't even begin to imagine. And even in the present, it can be glorious. It's going to be painful at times. There's going to be tears. There's going to be hardships. But our hope can remain strong in our Lord. We will be in the presence forever. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. I mean, what an incredible future we have. What, next slide. What can be accomplished through our trials? So, I mean, one of the things we might ask, is there any good that can come out of this? Well, one of the things it does, it refines our strength. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, 
But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. This is Paul speaking to Corinthians. So that the power of Christ may rest upon me. It helps build dependence on God. And this is one of the things that I learned as we went through this. Man, I was seeking the Lord like crazy. And I realized I could get pretty distracted. Um, First Corinthians or Second Corinthians one eight for we so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despi- despair of life itself, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead, and He refines us. In James one four and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And then last, one of the things that yields it equips us to comfort others. One of the things that Chris and I have found is all the things we've gone through, I can't say to someone who's lost their spouse or lost their child, oh, I know what you're going through, because I haven't. I almost lost my spouse, it came close. So I can't say that I totally understand what they're going through, because every situation's different. But God has used the things that he's brought us through and the things that we've learned to help comfort others. And that's how, that's how God is using it. I was used to standing up and teaching. I taught all the time for the longest time. And that was, I said to the pastor, I said, I really want to teach. And he says, well, how'd you like to do some counseling? I said, counseling? I've never counseled before. I said, well, I'll, I'll tell you what. If, if I try it and people start jumping off the roof, would you tell me? And he, and he said, uh, yeah. So I think he realized at that point maybe. But then he comes back and he says, well, how would you feel about leading grief share? So what are we doing in grief share? We're comforting and counseling. So God had a plan for us. And uh, so I think it leads me to Psalm 42.5. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation. I took the story... Um, and I've, you may say that this is your short version, but yes, this is my short version of the story. Um, but I've written about it and, and shared our experience and all the things that God has been teaching us uh, through a book. And I brought some with me in case anyone is interested. Um, and I would invite you uh, to, to check it out. I also want to share just one last thing. Um, a number of years ago, I was asked... Uh, by a cousin of mine to join him in a uh, project with Mercy Projects. Mercy Projects is a ministry that uh, cares for families, but in particular children. And their focus is on Eastern Europe and particularly Ukraine. So I went there, served as part of, uh, part of the team. Uh, we cared for children who came from alcoholic parents, drug addicted parents. They were in orphanages. They were bopping around between different foster homes. A lot of kids in really tough situations, and we just loved on them, taught them about Jesus, um, and just had just an absolutely wonderful time. So I loved it so much. I went back the following year. Team and I became really good friends. The fellow that you see in this picture became really good friends. Um, and yeah, later on, um, he came to the States, because he's also, as you, you'll see on this slide, he's a missionary. He's a full-time missionary with BCM International, which is Bible-centered missions. Leads 25 different missionaries. Uh, 15 of those are in the Ukraine. And he also oversees an orphanage in Mariupol. And if you followed the situation in Ukraine at all, you know about Mariupol and uh, terrible, terrible situation that they've been in. But... Uh, <sighs> When he came, he came to the States to visit some people that um, were supporting him, he spent a good bit of time, he and his family, with Chris and I, and we became very, very close. As this whole thing with Ukraine has unfolded, it has broken my heart. Um, I talked to the team about once a week. We video chat, um, and then we email each other, and, uh, and then he gives me pretty much daily updates. And... Uh, so, which has been very helpful, at the same time heartbreaking. Next slide. 
one of the he, one of the things he does with his missionaries is he goes out and he serves people in all the different towns, bringing all kinds of food, supplies, and things that they need to help them survive. Buta is a town where his parents live and a town where his brother lives. Um, he went out there, and this is what he saw. Everything was a wreck. Everything was bombed. They'd gone into all the houses and stolen all the valuables out of the homes and took them with them. And uh, so that was hard. What's been really hard, next slide, on Tima is the impact on his family and his friends. This is a picture of Nikolai. Nikolai was a pastor of a Baptist church uh, in Mariupol. He had 150 people living in the basement of his church just trying to survive. Nikolai went out one day driving his car to go get some food for the folks. And while he was driving, Russian soldier, bang, shot him, killed him in the car as he was driving. So his family, fortunately, has been able to reach Poland. Tima's family is in Poland. The two families are living together in Poland. But it is heartbreaking to see what's going on there. So I would ask, beg for your prayers. Um, he sends a letter out pretty much every day, a little short letter, and I then pass it on. I have about 100 people, friends and family, that I share it with. And when I do share, I make sure that the email addresses are blinded so nobody has access to the email addresses. But if you would like to be on that email address, I have a board where you can sign up. Just give us your name and your email, and I'll, I'll forward that to you. Um, I thank you for the time that you've given me today. I pray that um, the things that God has been teaching me and shared with me would be an encouragement to you. And uh, may to God always be the glory. We have a great, loving, merciful God who walks with us through the joyful times and through the really hard times. I'm so, so thankful for him. Thank you.